Neil Ferguson is here. He is an economic historian. He is a professor at Harvard. He is an author. You may also be familiar with his documentaries, which are broadcast on PBS. His writings about the economic crisis and a potential rupture in U.S.-China relations have received much attention and controversy. His most recent book is now in paperback. It is called The Ascent of Money, a Financial History of the World. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. Although it was a different table that we still use. This is a little smaller Did you table break for the last one? <laughs> Did you throw it at someone? <laughs> we turned it over on them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, economic recovery uh, in the United States last quarter, 3.5% growth. Is there a global economic recovery underway? I think there's a global economic recovery, which uh, looks actually rather more sustainable than the U.S. recovery. Most of the U.S. recovery uh, is in the form of, of stimulus from government, uh, the Cash for Clunkers program and the encouragement to first-time uh, home buyers. That accounted for a really large percentage, more Less than, than half. 50. Mm, pretty mm. close to half. If you mm. add those two things together, and then the rest of it has to do with inventories. I don't think this is a sustainable recovery yet. The recession is technically over, but I will be very surprised if the next quarter's numbers are as good because uh, these programs are expiring or have expired. The global recovery is more interesting because China, and not only China, also India and Brazil, plus a whole bunch of other mainly Asian economies, are growing much faster than I think anybody would have predicted six months ago. Uh, not many people back uh, in the dark days of the spring thought that even China would bounce back this strongly. Uh, but with growth now at an annual rate of around 10 percent, and interestingly, consumer growth in China growing even faster than that, there is clearly a global recovery. But the engine of growth is not the United States. For the first time, and one might say in a century, the engine of growth in the world economy is no longer the United States. But it hasn't it been the United States for a number of years. Well, no, the engine of growth uh, in the world economy was China plus the United exactly. States states in the last 10 years. But it was very much China plus the United States. You can actually figure this out if, if, if you look at the decade running up to the crisis, so 1998 to 2007, two-fifths of total growth in the world economy was China plus America. But of that two-fifths, the United States was the lion's share, just because it's, it's still the biggest economy in the world. And how much of it has to do with the Chinese stimulus? A lot, because that, in relative terms, is a very, very big shot in the arm of China's economy. Plus, China's stimulus has kind of worked better. Uh, it turns out that you can have That's Keynesian with policies. A command economy. Well, yeah, right. You can have Keynesian policies where you aim to stimulate demand through massive uh, government uh, uh, expenditure uh, financed by borrowing more easily in a controlled economy than in an open economy like that of the United States, which is a point, incidentally, that Keynes made in the 1930s. If you look at the foreword to the general theory, the 1936 classic, uh, in the German edition, Keynes says uh, that, that the policies he recommends of deficit financed government pump priming will work better in a controlled uh, totalitarian economy uh, than in a free open economy. And that, that's still true today. So what's the sort of your own sense of the American economy over the next two or three years? Well, I'm uh, relatively pessimistic about how fast growth is going to be. The administration earlier this year forecast that the economy would grow next year by 3.5%, then by 4%, then by 4.5% after that. I think that's highly unlikely to happen. My guess is that the economy will grow in real terms uh, at closer to 2% a year uh, for the next few years. And the reason I think that is that the U.S. consumer just can't bounce back in the way that we've been used to seeing in previous recessions. We've reached the limits of leverage on household balance sheets. Mm -hmm. When you've got debts that are equivalent to around 120 percent of personal disposable income, there's just no way that you can go back out to the shopping mall, uh, even if the credit card companies were cutting you some slack, which they're not. So I think if the U.S. consumer is essentially going to be uh, behaving in a, a parsimonious, even thrifty way, there's no way that the U.S. economy can grow at the rates that we've seen in the past. But is that the bind we're caught in? On the one hand, we've been living in this consumption society where China and other places have been a saving economy and now we need to be a consumption economy to fuel our 
economy, even though in the long term we need to be a saving economy. I, I think this is the problem, and there's no way that you can have the old-style debt-fueled consumption that was at the heart of our growth really over the last 20 years uh, once you reach this level of indebtedness. So that game is over, and we're in the process of a huge global rebalancing, which requires Americans to become more thrifty and requires Asians to become rather more profligate. We need the Chinese to go out shopping. We need them uh, to get into some well, debt. But that's their concern, whether they have created uh, a domestic demand demand that will replace the international demand for what they manufacture. Gradually, they are moving in that direction, but you can't do that sort of thing overnight. There is some evidence, I was in Hong Kong recently talking about this uh, to people who are expert about the Chinese consumer, there is some evidence that they are actually going out and shopping. Th there's a bit of a myth, actually, that the Chinese households are big savers. That's not actually true. Most of the saving that goes on in the Chinese economy is by corporations who make more money than they know what to do with. Uh, so actually, Chinese households are beginning to save less and they are going out yeah. and they are spending more but you know you can't transform a culture as thrifty as China's uh, in the space of a few months this will take years to unfold the key to the Chinese economy is creating a, a demanding middle class. Right. You, you need, in the end, to switch China's manufacturing uh, production to domestic demand and away from foreign demand. The Chinese model has been uh, export-driven really for, for decades now, but particularly for the last 10 years. They focused on getting a bigger and bigger market share, and particularly of the U.S. Uh, uh, consumer market, but also the European consumer market. And they did this by keeping their currency weak. Uh, and of course they did it by becoming ever Not more productive. Despite enormous pressure on the part of the United States and others to get them to... And this pressure achieved nothing. Uh, on the contrary, when the crisis struck, China cancelled all the slight appreciation that they'd allowed and reverted to a straight dollar peg. Now, that's really, really important, Charlie, because one way that the U.S. can uh, get itself going again is by letting the dollar weaken, because that will stimulate uh, U.S. exports, uh, and, and that's something that unofficially, tacitly, has become American policy. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese are you piggybacking on that. You will never see that. a politician say that. Oh, they're all in favor of the strong dollar. Exactly. <laughs> and the more you hear... <laughs> hear them say that they're in favor of the strong <laughs> the dollar, more you know they want the a weak more dollar. you know the dollar's <laughs> going down. Uh, so that's an old and long-established American practice. It goes back to the 1970s when John mm -hmm. Connolly, who was uh, Richard Nixon's Treasury, uh, Secretary. Treasury Secretary, said to the Europeans of the dollar, our currency your problem. We're doing it again this time around. It's yet another dollar devaluation designed to get the economy going. But the Chinese are piggybacking on this because, in effect, if we go down, the currency uh, of China, the renminbi, goes down too. So interestingly, China is not only growing its own domestic demand, actually it's also building up uh, its export market share again. Anybody who's on the wrong side of that process, like the Europeans with their increasingly strong euro, uh, or the Japanese with the strong yen, is getting killed, because the Chinese are just killing their manufacturing exports. All right, let's talk about how the, pro the prospect for America, because you make these terrifying analogies to the British Empire. You know, that our best days are behind us, uh, that Chimerica, which was a grand bargain, uh, is going to fall apart, uh, that our dollar will not be the reserve currency, uh, that, that we are looking at a deficit that is out of control. Well, so I think we should, should just give yeah, up. One should always, uh, one, one should never give up. That, <laughs> but, that's an important thing to bear in mind. But one should always be aware of British historians uh, yeah, predicting exactly, the decline exactly. of the United States. <laughs> right. My old friend yeah, Paul right. Kennedy did this in the late 1980s, and uh, of course it was the Soviet Union. The that end declined. of America, whatever his phrase oh. was with that book. Um, I think that one has to look very carefully at the problems that the United States faces and draw analogies with with great caution. But let me just put it. But this you way. do it. Well, uh, I do it with caution. <laughs> uh, let me just put it this way. At the end of World War II, the United Kingdom was as indebted in relation to its gross domestic product as the United States is today. If you include private debt, most of, of Britain's debt was public debt. Today, the United States has a huge mountain of private and public debt. And the public debt mountain is getting bigger very fast indeed, with a $9 trillion cumulative deficit over the next 10 years. There's no mm. question that that's unsustainable. I don't think anybody, even Paul Krugman, who loves deficits, would acknowledge that that is an unsustainable path.
with a nine trillion dollar cumulative deficit over the next ten years. There's no mm. question that that's unsustainable. I don't think anybody, even Paul Krugman, who loves deficits, would acknowledge that that is an unsustainable path for U.S. fiscal policy. What did policy. Keynes say about deficits? Well, Keynes, if, I, if, we're, if he were alive today, would say that this was excessive and unsustainable because most of this deficit is not a Keynesian stimulus package. That was less than a trillion dollars. Most of it's a structural uh, yeah. deficit because the United States spends much more every year, regardless of whether there's a, a, a boom or a bust, than it raises in taxation. So this can't be justified uh, in Keynesian terms. It's a fundamental crisis of public finance, which the political class in Washington seems unable and, uh, to address. And that's the problem. They do not have the political will to do that. It is a question of political will because the underlying strength of the U.S. economy is almost certainly greater than that of, of the British economy in 1945. But public finance and this is one of the points I try to make in the ascent of money, can trump your economy even if you have a wonderful workforce, tremendous natural resources and all the rest of it. Think of Argentina. And my worry is not only that there's a British imperial parallel, but there's also a Latin American parallel here. That the United States is in danger of evolving into a Wait, Latin Argentina? American economy. Well, in the sense that Argentina <laughs> was about the fourth richest country in the world a hundred years ago. Yeah. And over that hundred year period, systematically blew it as a result of mismanagement of its public so finance. The currency was worth nothing. Well, currency after currency. How many currencies did they have? How many defaults? The United States is on an unsustainable fiscal path. And we know that that, that path okay, but, ends in one of two ways. You either default on the debt or you depreciate it away. You inflate it away with, with your currency eff effectively. So we're running out of money. Reserve currency. We run out of money because. Well, you can we, end up with too much money, or rather the opposite. Well, if you we run print out of money because, out of a, because it's worthless, and, and the more you print, it's worthless. Or you run out of money because, you know, you, you've got all this debt and you can't service the debt. What you run out of is credit. Oh, Remember, yes. the okay. United States well, relies on foreigners who currently hold half the federal debt and to finance its borrowing habit. If it, foreigners lose confidence in the U.S. as a borrower, and if they lose confidence in the dollar as a currency, then things can turn ugly quite quickly. And that seems to me to be a think, lesson of history. I mean, I talk to these people as much as you do, as you know. You know, they don't seem to me that they are about to be frightened by the American economic future. I do not hear them saying, oh, my God. You know, it's over for America, so we better not A, buy any more dollars, or B, we better not, uh, we better the, find alternative investments. But these are the same people who, in late 2006 and early 2007, were telling me and perhaps you too that there would never be another recession in the United States because the great moderation. No, I'm not the Chinese who, who have the who who are doing, buying the debt. They're well, saying we buy the debt because it's when we look around, it's the best place because we still have confidence in America. Well, that's not really what they think. It may be what they say. Two things. First of all, they're buying a lot less than they used to, where we need them to buy a lot more. Uh, in 2007, at peak, they were buying three quarters of all the new debt issued right. by the U.S. Treasury. Now it's about 10 percent. Uh, we are issuing much, much more, uh, and they're buying much less, because they feel that $2 trillion is about enough, really. I mean, if you look yeah. at their international reserves, which are predominantly held in dollars, they have a huge well, amount. It was about a billion dollars a day for a while, wasn't it, it? It was an extraordinary amount of money that was flowing from China to the United States to finance our borrowing habit. So and we if, could buy their goods. So we could buy their goods. It's vendor finance, yeah. if you like and it worked well for a time but I always argued that Chimerica was un right. unstable that's why it was called Chimerica it was a pun on the word chimera right. and I think it was a chimera and I think it's proved to be certainly from the vantage point of the United States I think it served China much better than it served the United States they have been growing their economy at 10% a yeah. year. They're on track to overtake us by 2027. Uh, well, and we in return us not per capita, but overtake, overtake us in terms of the in size terms of the economy. Of gross domestic product. Right. Not in per capita right. terms. That right. will take course, many, many a years. Perhaps plus in the population. Right. All right, so you think that'll happen when, 2030? Well, I, I'm only quoting uh, Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs, whose projection right, was right. that in 2027, and I always joke on April the 14th at half past two in the afternoon, China's GDP would exceed that of the United States. But it's credibly in that ballpark, and that's a real historical moment. There hasn't really been a point in the last century when anybody looked like doing that. A few people thought Japan might uh, in, the, in the glory days of the 1980s, but I think the Chinese 
Chinese challenge is a more credible one, not least because of the sheer size of, of China, mm. but also because they do have a model that seems to deliver, even if it delivers at, at the expense of others. And that's why I think okay. their currency policy is a real source of concern. But you also argue about China, that, in, that as their economy grows, uh, their politics have to change, and they're unlikely to change, and therefore when the game looks bad for them, they're going to turn nationalistic, and then the problem become an aggressive China. I think this needs to be a concern as, as the Chinese leadership changes. The next generation of Chinese leaders, I think, will be more assertive. And they have up their sleeve this wonderful trump card. If things go wrong, and they may, I mean, let's face it, every Asian economic miracle is punctuated by at least one financial crisis. If things go wrong, they can call on a formidable popular nationalism. Uh, that's a sentiment which we know as historians mm. can always be called upon when the yeah. going gets tough economically, which but, it will sooner or later. But your premise is based on two things. One, the Chinese political system will not change, A, mm. and B, the United States will not have the political will to deal with this deficit. Yeah. Now, I, the, I, I think both the, of those the, are reasonable assumptions. On this very same program uh, that you're on, uh, the director of the Office and Management and Budget says that we will take the deficit of 2009 and by 2012-13 we will have it. So by the time this president finishes his first term we will cut the deficit in half. So that suggests some political will, if you believe him, well, to do it, uh, it it's, to deal with the deficit. It, it would still therefore be a, around 6% of gross domestic product. Yeah. Uh, now that, that is a very large deficit uh, in any normal circumstances. So to half it from 12 or so percent of GDP to six doesn't constitute fiscal stabilization. You still will it, be borrowing around a it, trillion it, dollars it a year. It constitutes progress, for it's, God's sake. It's, it's progress. But my question is, where in their plans do we get to budget balance? Because in the, in, it's clear from uh, the forecast that he himself has made that the U.S. continues to run a deficit over a 10-year horizon. And if you look further beyond 10 years, because it's very important to do that, uh, and take into account the unfunded liabilities of the Medicare and Social Security systems, uh, the, the position of the United States verges on bankruptcy because although we have a ten trillion dollar debt, the unfunded liabilities are a hundred trillion dollars, and that's something that it seems to me one can't lightly dismiss. Warren Buffett, as we speak today, made a huge multi-billion dollar, thirty to forty billion dollar investment in railways, yes. saying this is my confidence in the American economy. Well, good luck to him. Well, he's. he's knows something about economies and investments, doesn't he? Oh, sure. And his track record's been very impressive okay. until so very recently. And no. it's been less so. I mean, well, it's no, it's possible... Been, it was less so last year, but right. it's come back. Right. So it's, it's possible that he's right, and I'm wrong. I don't rule that out. And that all is going to be well, and that the U.S. is going to bounce back. Are you just prepared to say it's either Buffett or me in yeah. terms well, of analysis? I, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to bet with him, though I probably can't uh, put down quite as much money yeah. as he can in this bet. I'm a humble academic. Uh, but it does seem to me that a better bet would be yeah. to put money on not just China, but actually China's trading partners. I mean, I would rather buy Australian yeah. railroads than American railroads, because I know that stuff is being shipped from Australia to China in much larger quantities than is currently being shipped coast to coast in the United States. I mean, actually, freight traffic on U.S. railroads is at an extraordinarily low level right now with very little sign of improvement. So he's a very optimistic man, I would say. And you think he's making a serious mistake? I do, because I don't really see that the United States can grow at rates rapid enough to make yeah. that investment pay cheap, uh, though the price may be. Now, uh, of course, it's reckless of me to take on Warren Buffett. But you know what? what? Uh, this is a, a moment in history when the things that have been true for his entire life may have ceased to be true. The biggest problem that anybody faces today is that their lifetime experience, even if the life is as long as Warren Buffett's, is no longer a reliable guide to the future. Why? Because we just missed a Great Depression by a, a hair's breadth, and we missed it by throwing a vast quantity of money at the U.S. economy, by running a deficit as large as we were seeing in World War II in peacetime. Nobody knows whether that will create unintended consequences that will ultimately slow the economy down. The My instinct is that it will. Okay, the question, let, let me just go to a little tangent real quick. Was that the wrong thing to do, to well, throw that money at... And at a time that this economy needed uh, somebody to do something dramatic, are you suggesting that the thing go to a little tangent real quick? Was that the wrong thing to do, to well, throw that money at, and at a time that this economy needed uh, somebody to do something dramatic, 
Are you suggesting that the things they did was wrong? No, but there were two policies, one of which was more important than the other. The monetary policy that Ben Bernanke pursued at the Fed, particularly after the Lehman crisis last year, of a massive expansion of the monetary base uh, was clearly the right policy, and that's the policy that Milton Friedman would have recommended had he still been alive. Who was a great monetarist. Uh, who was a monetarist, and, and saw the cause of the Great Depression as being bank failures and monetary tightening by the Fed. We learnt that lesson. The, the other mm -hmm. policy, the Keynesian right. policy, involves adding an enormous deficit on top of an already large structural deficit. And I don't think that that has been anything like as important in getting the economy out of the Depression scenario. And I think one has to make that distinction. The fiscal policy could turn out to be okay as long as we know how to stabilize it but right now we don't right now we are clearly out of fiscal control and at some point the world is going to wake up to that and say it is no well, longer I mean, sensible to pile these bonds up in the in a reasonable expectation that the United States will either depreciate the debt away by letting the dollar okay. fall through the floor or will actually start to call into question uh, its own commitment to these payments I, I mean default is not a scenario we can rule out let me put it that way Default well, there is not a scenario we can rule out. When you look at the unfunded liability... We're going to default on our debt, and therefore, well, what does that mean? What will happen first is that we'll default on the commitments made uh, under the Medicare and Social Security systems. That default, the domestic default, on our, as it were, domestic creditors is an almost certain outcome. The only question is which president takes it, uh, which president grasps that nettle and admits that we cannot possibly fulfill those commitments. The other question of default seems to me less likely. We're not likely to default on our uh, outstanding bonds held by foreigners. But foreigners may begin to question the sustainability of a fiscal policy that requires us to borrow a trillion dollars a year. And what well, they'll well, do uh, when uh, they do that uh, is that they'll... Uh, everybody, but, everybody but, believes but, that. But everybody, right. wait, stop. So, everybody believes that you what cannot, that means. What you that cannot means. continue at the pace we're yeah. doing. So, everybody agrees with that, but they do not necessarily assume yeah. that they're not policies and actions that can prevent the disaster of default that you are of arguing are inevitable. Are. Of course there are. For example, the United States could introduce a value-added tax right. or a federal sales tax. Right. But can you imagine this Congress doing that? Well, I don't know. It depends, I on, it, it depends on the options they look at at the time. So let's, you know, let, I mean, you've let got, me, right. you've so got so people like Roger Altman coming on this program saying they're going to have to have a value-added tax. Yeah. If they look at the thing and Neil Ferguson is saying to them, this is a disaster you face, perhaps they'll say, thank you, Neil. Maybe we better do something, and they'll add a value-added tax. Maybe they'll begin to believe that you've got to change the taxing policy. But you remember Winston Churchill's great observation that the United States always does the right thing at when all the other thing. possibilities have been exhausted. Uh -huh. I feel we're doing that now in the realm of fiscal policy. And the, the reason I mentioned default is not because I think the United States is going to turn into Mexico or Argentina overnight. Well, you almost suggested no, that earlier. Let me make this point really clear, because it's absolutely crucial. In order to persuade investors to continue to buy U.S. government bonds, we will have to offer them a higher interest rate for their money. Now, when uh, that uh, happens, yeah. the bonds go down in price, the yields go up, our fiscal crisis immediately gets worse because the cost of servicing this vast $10 trillion debt goes up. That's what worries me most because what you could then get is a situation where real interest rates go up and that's crippling for a heavily indebted economy just as it's crippling for a heavily indebted household. That's why I worry about Buffett's bet. That's why I think the U.S. could find itself slowing down in 2010-11, not speeding up. Who do you know that, of note, from whatever background, academia, government, Wall Street, believes exactly as you say? Let me name just one. Okay, just name one. Uh, uh, Ken Rogoff, oh, sure, my he's coming down here on this program Harvard, this week, has just published a book. I know, but he comes this time from the different. same place, yes. Well, he comes from the same university, but yeah. I wouldn't say he comes from the same place. He's an economist, right. uh, a very distinguished economist who used yeah. to be the International Monetary Fund. Uh, he and I think very in very similar ways about this problem, to, to name but one. I, I think if you were to ask uh, George Soros, is he optimistic about the outlook uh, for agree, the United agree. States, George Soros, you would get oh, a very three, pessimistic reply. So um, what about Paul Volcker, who's a distinguished American? Uh, I think former he would, Chairman's Federal Reserve. I, I think, if anything, he is more pessimistic than the two people I've just mentioned. Um, of course, it's hard for him to express publicly his disquires yeah. uh, because so of his official you position. Think the, the Obama administration is just wrong-headed. 
No, I, 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 listen, I don't want to criticize uh, some very clever individuals who are grappling with a huge historical Larry problem. Summers, Tim Larry Geiger, Larry Summers, my ben former Bernanke. boss. These are some of the smartest people, Christy Roma, some right, of the Chris smartest Hill. people uh, in, in the Austin world. Austin Goldstein. I have huge regard for all of them. So, therefore, and I think what, what's the difference you, if, in them and you, so if, the people who have the power? What's the they, difference in the people who have the Charlie, power? they don't have the power. They don't. The Congress has the power. That's what people don't seem to understand about the situation we're in. Right now, the president proposes, with his clever advice, is helping him, but Congress disposes, and it will be Congress that decides whether the health care bill ultimately adds to the deficit or does not. But it, are you suggesting that if they have the deficit in four years, that that's not putting us on the track to a balanced budget, if they well, continue that kind of progress? But it's not, because their numbers, their 10-year numbers that they published in the budget, right. don't put us on course for a balanced budget. They put us on course to carry on borrowing a trillion dollars a year, as, as far as the eye can see. And that, it seems to me, is a recipe for trouble. Because there comes a point, and this is one of the lessons of, of financial history, there comes a point when the international markets simply can't take any more. And what's interesting about this is it's non-linear. It's not that people gradually lose faith in the credit worthiness of a country or gradually lose faith in a currency as an international reserve currency. It can happen quite suddenly that expectations change. That's what the British experience tells you. In 1945, Churchill still thought of the British Empire as a mighty force, equal in power to the Soviet Union and the United States. But it was a heavily indebted empire. Debt GDP was about 250%. What's more, the British then embarked on health care reform, the National Health Service, thinking that they had limitless funds to devote to rewarding themselves for the sacrifices I of the war. I remind you that the American health care reform that is proposed is supposed to be uh, a, a, a deficit neutral. Yes, uh, we'll see uh, if it really is. I, I'd, be in, yeah. I'd be impressed. But here is the idea that nobody thinks that America is, that the world order is changing. You know, and you point that out. There is a new economic order and there's a new political order. We know that there's a level of shift of power to the, to the West, East. You know, and, and the president knows it. Everybody in Europe knows it. That's not, a, that's not an idea that people are people, suggesting you know, is not true. But it, it's not that they no don't saying, say it. But do we really grasp what this means? For 500 years, the world has moved in the direction of the West. And the United States was the last of the great Western past to benefit from this shift of resources uh, from East to West. We're living through a change that ends 500 years of history, a great rebalancing of the world that will see Asian powers yeah. become equal in their stature in economic terms and then latterly it, in it, geopolitical it, terms. Is it a zero-sum sure really really zero game? It can be. Well, but is it? Well, is a it lot depends, or not? Right? Is it Maybe the United States is better off with a smaller share of a larger pie. Uh, of course, but you know, the share is always going to be getting smaller as these Asian economies grow uh, and as no, we well, slow down. My point and is I, think, I think the, the big question, which I don't really see being addressed, is how do you cope with the rise of a credible rival? The Soviet Union was never going to have an economy the same size as the United States. It never came close. And today Russia's economy is 4% the size uh, of the US. We are facing a genuine superpower, a real economic rival. And I don't think American foreign policy has yet adapted to that. I think there's an assumption in what Washington would it do that we carry it, on with what, China America. What, what would it do if it's su to suggest it had adapted to that? What would it so do? So let me put it this way. There is a very clear dilemma which isn't often enough discussed. And that is this. Do we accommodate China's rise? And do we accept, rather as Britain accommodated the rise of the United States, that one day it will in fact be the dominant power in the world and we just better live with that? Or do we try to balance it the way the United Kingdom sought to balance the rise of Germany by making alliances with the other powers in that region, India being the obvious candidate? That is the dilemma that is right at the heart of US foreign policy today. And yet I have the impression that we're so distracted by our colonial wars, and I call them colonial wars quite consciously in Iraq and Afghanistan, that we we don't see that big picture. The Chinese see it very clearly. Uh, and at least one of the superpowers in this game is thinking in the right kind of terms about the way the world is going, both economically and geopolitically. Neil Ferguson, whose book and paperback is called The Ascent of Money, which is also the title of his documentaries. Thank you for joining us tomorrow night, former Vice President.